Hello there. My name is Jay Lanfear, faculty at Clover Park Technical College. Part of the Network Operations System Security Team. There's six of us. We do a great job, by the way. So this is our security podcast where we bring former students, industry professionals, sometimes uh, people that are just uh, unrelated to the program that are interesting to talk to. So today, I bring you two guests that are former graduates of Clover Park. They've been in industry for a while now, probably seven or eight years, closer to eight. And uh, they've uh, also volunteered their time to train, uh, to help train our students to prepare for our uh, annual cyber defense competition. Uh, I I cannot thank them enough. A couple of my favorite people in the world. So let me introduce them today. And uh, we're just going to have a kind of a quick private discussion about maybe what life is like as a pen tester, as a red teamer, as a blue teamer. All those things. All right. So here we are with two, you know, guys, I was going to say recent, but it's been a long time. Rob Curtin Seifert and Jareth Kelly. So, so if you guys just want to do a quick introduction on yourselves, uh, who you're currently working with and for, and I'm so grateful that you guys could, uh, you know, spend some time with us today and uh, talking about some you know, not only how you got here, but what it took to get here, what it takes to keep your job, you know, because we've talked about that in the, in the past. And uh, and again, this is a friendly reminder, this is a PG rated show, maybe PG-13. So, Rob? Awesome. So my name is Rob curtin Seifert. I'm a Clover Park Technical College alumni. I graduated in 2014. Um, and I'm currently the director of services at a petite consulting firm called in guardians. All right. Jareth. Thanks Rob. Yeah. Um, I'm Jareth Kelly. Uh, I am also an alumni from Clover park. Uh, also working at the same company as Rob. Uh, I'm a senior managing consultant with in guardians. All right. Thanks Jareth. Yeah. It's, uh, Gosh, it's been what seven, eight years since you guys graduated. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. And uh, part of your team at In Guardians is other Clover Park graduates as well, right? Correct. Yes, it yeah, is. Too far. Yeah, yep. So, so what do you guys think? Since you made it to the big leagues, tell me about it. Yeah, uh, you know. Uh, Graduating Clover Park, uh, one of the things that uh, I, my goal was to be a penetration tester and red team operator when the day I showed up and uh, going through the, the program and graduating, getting my first pen testing job to now, is it's been a dream. It's been hard. I uh, made some sacrifices along the way, but it, it's been fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's great to see that it's not just a, a single person right that did it and it's it's a group of people that have come out of there and we've taken the industry by storm come out of clover park um so it's to me it's amazing yeah i I really like the fact that we've got quite a few people from uh clover park on our team and even worked with some in the past at uh previous company and i when i started going to clover park i you know, I, I kind of actually ended up there just by happenstance. I, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do for school. I was just about to finish high school, started looking at some colleges, and I was like, oh, computers. I like that. Let's go there. <laughs> so, right. uh, and, it, and it wasn't too far from where I lived. So, um, just started going to Clover Park. And, uh, you know, I always kind of just enjoyed messing around, breaking stuff, uh, kind of figuring out how things work and just... You know, there was a small little class about pen testing and stuff and kind of drew my interest. So I did a lot of learning on the side. But, um, you know, I never really thought that I'd make it a career at first. Definitely not not like Rob, where, you know, my goal was to be a penetration tester. I just wanted to do something with computers and it just caught my interest. 
and just happened to be, I guess, right place, right time, knew the right people, and, and kind of landed in the industry. At least early on. I, who knows, maybe if I would have, you know, been a sysadmin for a long time, maybe that's where I would have landed too. So, Jared, do you, have you ever seen uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine or Next Generation? I've watched some Star Trek, but I'm not that familiar with it. So more Rob of a Star Wars guy myself. Where I'm going with us, but there's the uh, transporter operator or the Miles, o the famous Miles O'Brien that can pretty much fix or break into anything, and that's who you remind me of. Yeah, Rob shaking his head, yes. So, yeah, Jared, I I, I recall it well. You could, you know, pretty much fix anything, anything that was broken. So. He had a natural aptitude. He does. One of the, the jokes is I break all the things and Jared fixes them just by looking at them. You would be surprised at how many times, <laughs> hey, Jared, this isn't working. What's right. going on? What am I doing wrong? Well, show me. And then I do the exact same thing that I was doing before and it would work because Jared right. was there. It is the magic touch, not the cheese touch. Right. Correct. Well, and I've even been told by one of the guys on our team that I'm the kind of person that'll just go seek out some new exploit or something online, dig through the code for a bit and have it working within a couple hours, you know, whereas I'll, there's a good portion of the team where they'd probably feel very uncomfortable with that, right? <laughs> At least, you know, right out the bat, like, oh, uh, you know, some, some code just leaked to Twitter or Payspin somewhere and, you know, the crime groups right. have been exploiting it for the last couple weeks or whatever. That's right. that's where that's where I go. I'm like, oh, let's go find some of that. Let's go pop some fun exploits on a network. Yeah, let's get some crime software and reverse engineer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You'd be surprised at how many exploits that penetration testers users that like use, right? That actually came from that world. It's just been stepped over um to make sure that it was safe, um, defangled in some instances for other callbacks and you know, uh, used, right? Reverse engineered and, and put out there. And Jared's really good at finding that stuff. Really, really good. So seriously, guys, why IT security? So Rob, you kind of knew the direction that you wanted to go. Jareth, you just kind of, I, I guess it would be okay to say that you fell into it because that was your, you found your passion. And so Rob, just why? I mean, a little background well, on that. Well, yeah, it's a little complex, but it's um, stressful. It's it not is. an easy thing. It's very hard. Correct. Uh, I, I was always into computer security back in, in the days in, in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, I always just had a knack for finding my ways into things uh, that I probably shouldn't have, right? Um, and uh, you know, I got my first job offer by at college, and I want to say about 2002 to do this. But unfortunately for them, um, I, I was I joined the military um, and okay. went into right. went to the army and, and did that for about a decade. And uh, I wanted something that I, I felt that I was, uh, you know, a part of something bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And talking to people um and, and looking at the industries where i wanted to go uh it was not a one for one swap right um you know sending packets across the way to do adversary emulation uh to help them secure and build their network about to secure their networks and build them out stronger or you know emulating the newest threats um you still get that you know you know adversarial rush right i still get when i get shells back i still get that adrenaline piece going and you know for me it's just uh you know always been a part of who i am uh and the other part of, of who i am is i like breaking things or and putting them back together taking them apart putting them back together batter uh, put them putting them back together and just figuring out how things work mm -hmm. um and uh, you know i have family who work in in it um uh, and i talked to them and um it was just a, a natural fit, I guess it'd be the thing. It's always something I was interested in. 
uh, it replicates some of the military aspects that I, I fell in love with in the military, having a great team. It's, you know, being something a part of uh, being a part of something that's bigger than just you as an individual um, and helping defend and strengthen companies and municipalities and, and return our nation. So it's kind of why I, I like uh, information security and, and offensive side, at least. So do you feel like you need to be competitive as a person, maybe a person where you played sports prior, maybe you didn't, you know, is there any kind of like competitive feeling that you, this desire that you have to go compete either against yourself, maybe, or against someone's network? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it is competitive, right? Um, for me, I, I don't compete against anybody but myself. Am I better than I was yesterday? Am I better than I was two weeks ago, a year ago, a month ago? Right. Yeah. Um, that's I've how I, that I am. Yeah. I'm very, very competitive uh, against myself, right? I'm always striving to be a better version of me that I could be. Um, but yeah, uh, the people that I see that are successful uh, in this industry, I want to say are, are super ultra competitive, but are highly competitive um, and have that... Um, mentality where it's like not win at all costs but you know you don't fall when someone pushes back on you you kind of stand up and you have that resiliency that mental resiliency that comes from being in in competitive sports or something along those lines i think mm -hmm. that that would be the best way um also you know just getting in there and, and getting the the work done in the time frame allotted uh that's also very competitive, I guess, be the, the mindset you need. What are your thoughts, Jareth? Uh, I don't think I could have said that any better. I'd, I'd kind of agree. Um, I, I was never one for sports. And I mean, even now, I don't really, I'll en I enjoy watching them very, very little understand them, I guess. Um, but I, I guess I've always kind of had a little bit of a competitive nature. Usually it's against myself. Like Rob said, kind of always want to be better the next day. Uh, definitely had a lot of instances that I beat up on myself um, where I felt like I didn't, uh, I didn't really live up to a certain standard, or I didn't get better on a next engagement. I felt like I kind of backtracked, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely really competitive with myself. Uh, definitely not competitive with. Um, you know, other operators, other people that I work with, I try to, unless we're specifically wanting to say, hey, let's play a little game, who can get to, you know, domain administrator first, or who can find the biggest uh, flaw in this, this network or application or what have you. But usually that's more fun than it is uh, competitive, I guess. So how does everyone... I... Go ahead, Rob. I will say that the competitive comes out um, and there's a story that goes with this is like um, when when the client goes, well, I don't know why we're doing this. We're the most secure people on the planet. Uh -huh. You you can't yeah. do this. We we we're super secure. This is pointless. Uh, we're wasting our time, our breath, our money. Um, that's when the the apex predator comes out because then you're just like you're not um there's always room for improvement let me show you so yeah. mm -hmm. that's when it turns into you know the the us against them mentality but that is really rare because a lot of people and organizations realize that this is a two-way street we're helping you right and and you know we're here for you your success is our success it's just when we get those those people who are very adversarial that that's when the the fangs and the talents come out, right? Yeah, and I don't think uh, sometimes IT departments understand what red, blue, and purple mean, and th those are all words uh, from it's not gray hat, black hat, white hat. Those are really old terms, and that red, blue, purple is so modern that it all means one thing. It's, you know, teamwork, regardless of what team that you're on. And uh, I agree, Rob. I, I just don't think that uh, some IT departments understand that. Right. Part of the same thing. Red, yeah, people don't realize red and blue team actually goes back to the old military force and force training, right? 
where the blue team is the defending team and the red team is the attacking or the adversarial team. And it's meant Risk. to help the blue team get better and better and better, right? So like, so, you know, like, let's say, you know, you're the quote unquote blue team and this field exercise, your job is to go out there and secure this village. Well, the red team is going to be there to try to disrupt you, right? Deter you and push you off of that objective. Uh, the goal isn't to embarrass anybody. The goal isn't to be like, I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm stronger than you. The goal is to make the blue team better at at the end of the day, that's all it is, right? We're not out to embarrass anybody. We're not out to make anybody look bad. The goal is to be better than when you started this engagement. And the only way that you could know how to def defend against stuff is to actually have someone come at you, right? How do, right. how do you get to know how well your defense in depth is? How are you go? How else are you going to know how your users are going to respond? How else are you going to know if your policies and procedures actually work like intended, if you don't test them. Yep. Yep. So, so how, how do you guys do it though? I mean, what does a typical day look like in your, your field of, uh, it security? Well, I want to start, uh, by saying we're consultants. Um, so our day to day looks very different depending on the engagement we do, right? So our week this week will look different than the week next week because we do short haul engagements. We do long haul engagements as well, right? So these engagements that last like a month, month and a half, Gareth and I have been on a couple of those, right? Um, I'm on one right now, actually. Right. Yeah. So um, do you have to travel? No travel. Okay. At least at the moment. We have traveled in the past. Yeah. COVID kind of I, washed that a little bit. I, I definitely spent uh, just about every week for, what, almost two, three years uh, traveling pretty not much every week. Yeah, not within Guardian's previous uh, company. Right. Right. Um, but, you know, we get in, we meet with our team in the morning. Um, and, uh, we work towards together in a collaborative manner to achieve the goals of the assessment. Um, and we rinse repeat. Um, so one day we could be straight focused on, you know, Hey, bypassing the WAF wireless, uh, wireless, but the web application firewall, or, you know, trying to map out, see if we do SQL injection or something along those lines, if it's an application or lateral movement or reconnaissance in an internal network or red team operation, right? Uh, but the, the key thing here is that we're never alone. We have a full team with us and we're constantly communicating no matter what we're doing in our pieces. So I guess those are the things that, that stay throughout all of our days, communication, teamwork, communication. And I say communication right. twice because that's the most important thing. You know, I, the reason why I brought up this uh, competitive nature and what I've noticed in people that go into this field of IT security, regardless if you're a consultant or not, is those people are competitive and uh, it's typically traditionally previously not in sports. So it's like, uh, you know, independent play as a child, those types of things. And the reason why I ask you what your day looks like as you brought it up is you're working with a group of people and uh, IT security is all about working with a team. And no, no one has that ultimate answer of what the, the great solution is. And, uh, you know, so I know that your, your team, I've, I've met them over, you know, virtually over Zoom. And uh, there, there's a really good dynamic there between all of you guys of how you, everyone kind of knows their role. And in what you do, leaping from a two-year degree into what you do is extremely difficult. And so I, I must think that there's something with the, this interpersonal competitiveness that you guys have, that everyone possesses that same thing, that same trait. And so it is, yeah, it is. And in fact, it, it's a little bit I'm more afraid to fail. It is. It's a, it's yeah. a, it, it, 
this common themes that we have is we're all pretty much I'll say almost perfectionists. We're not total perfectionists, but really close to being perfectionists. Um, we have great communication skills, interpersonal communication skills. Um, the other thing too is uh, we have confidence in ourselves and our teammates, but we don't have egos. Right. We leave our egos at the door. One of the right. biggest things that we realize with the team that we have is uh, that, you know, we're greater as a sum. Right. Yep. Then, yep. then the individual parts combined. Right. right? So um, to me, that's, that's important, but to go on your, uh, so a little further is all the operators, uh, I'm going to go nerdy for a second, uh, either belong to the Slytherin Harry Potter house right. or Ravenclaw. Okay. okay. All right. Yep. There I'm is no Huffle. There's no Hufflepuffs. Sure. And there's no Gryffindors, just Slytherin right. or Ravenclaw. That's it. At, at right. Guardians. Just don't cross the line. Yep. Don't go to the dark side. But, uh, I just thought that was one day we just figured that out, Jareth, and it was very interesting. Yeah. I I think uh, kind of one of the things, too, it, when it comes to our team is, like, we're all constantly learning, right? That's, that's one of the biggest things is that we constantly want to learn something new. We constantly want to advance our knowledge. And then we also, we also want to share it with the team. Uh, there are... I can't tell you the amount of times that we've uh, one of us has learned something and we bring in the group to share and kind of spread that knowledge around or show how something, you know, how something works or how we were able to get in, you know, via exploit or some kind of abuse of a service or what have you. Um, I mean, even one engagement, I was trying to learn something new. Uh, I was up really, really late. Uh, one of our, um, our previous contractors, he just happened to be online and I was chatting with him and he jumped on, uh, showed me some stuff. And the next morning I kind of brought it back to the team and, and shared the, the info back to everybody. Um, yeah, I, I think kind of one of those, one of those things is just kind of general sh knowledge sharing, right? We all, we all want to get better. I think, I think more than anything is everyone has an insatiable, hunger for knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that, Rob. Yep. What about, uh, imposter syndrome? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Say yeah. again. Every, Every day? day. Every day. I don't think people know uh, knows what that means. Maybe you can help us. Um, yeah. Uh, so for uh, imposter syndrome, is you know uh, a real thing especially in our industry and it's where you know for me it's like if only these people knew how much i used google like they would lose all respect for me or maybe they wouldn't right. you know come back right. uh, to us or um you know if only my you know co-workers realized that i used google to find the answer to the question that they just asked right you get you get what i was sure. you know yeah. and it's feeling like you don't you don't know enough. You're not good enough because, uh, you know, we have these expectations of ourselves. Yeah. Right. Uh, that comes with that, that are... highly competitive individualism that we have. Correct. And, um, so that, that's, that's imposter syndrome. And, um, and in fact, when I was interviewing here and in a guardians, they, you know, I said, well, they gave me a scenario question and, and had me walk through it. And I was like, well, this is, I don't know the answer, but this is right where I would use Google to find the answer. Um, and uh, they respected me more for that, right? Because, you know, I wasn't afraid to say that. Um, and I was given a talk a couple of times at a couple of campuses. And the question that they always gets asked me is, what's the number one uh, hacking tool you use? And my answer is Google, right? Sure. Um, Sure. But I'm open I've about it, but it's also in public. Yeah. 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 But it, it's also part of my imposter syndrome, right? Uh, if only sure. the client knew how much I Googled, right? Um, because it's my friend. Uh, well, I, I think you're right, Rob. And I, I think it, it takes the ability to uh, put all those pieces together to make something of it. Anybody could, you know, just do a quick Google search and not be successful. 
And I do remember when you brought that up, I believe it was 2018 on campus of Clover Park. I heard this, <gasps> Rob said he Googles, you know, stuff to, to find out. And that person that asked you the question later on came up to me and said, I, I don't believe it. I said, no, it, it's true. So, but, but the important thing is you have to understand the basics to put all those, you know, building blocks together to make something of it. And so that's the foundational part of education is you're always improving upon yourself because we're always competitive against ourselves, you know, as being imposters. So. Yeah. What do you think, Jareth? Uh, yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I mean, I don't really have much more to add besides the fact that like we're, we're never going to have all the answers right away. Right. And it's just a matter of trying to find out either places to research information, how to further that knowledge. Maybe that's a Google search that leads you to a book or a blog post or, you know, what have you. Right. There's just because we are professionals and we are experts in our field, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have every answer all the time. We don't just because I'm a professional here does not mean that I automatically know everything there is to possibly know about mobile application testing or how to secure that that mobile application, right? It takes time and research and, uh, you know, working with not only uh, information you find online or what have you, or uh, reading books, but also working with any kind of other team, like, you know, we work with clients. So maybe sometimes it takes us Googling and learning some stuff, but also going back to a client to get more information from them about a certain scenario or application or what have you. So, I mean, it's, you never have every piece of the puzzle and you need to have a way to identify how to put that puzzle together. Right. Right. And, That's a no ego part is what you're saying. Cause it's not yeah. about you. Yeah. It's about your team. You don't want to let them down. Correct. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on that and I'm going to say some advice that was given to me, um, in the middle of one of my biggest imposter moments. Uh, and that was when I started working at Ingardians. Uh, I looked around and there were giants of the industry surrounding around me and I felt mice like a mouse in, amongst men. Um, and uh, I was trying to, you know, emulate and, and be be like them because they were giants, right? Uh, yeah, that's a lot of pressure. Said, hey, yep. And they, they pulled me aside and they said, uh, hey, I don't need another X person, Y person, Z person. I need Rob. I, I be you, right? You're great. And I'm like, man, I'm not, you know, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel very, very, you know, highly myself this time. Um, and they're uh, dealing really bad imposter syndrome. And uh, Tyler Robinson, uh, he goes, man, you're, you're an amazing infosec professional. Like, why don't you think you are? And I said, well, I don't know, you know, these things. And he's just like, oh, Oh, you think, no, 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 no. We don't know that. Let me explain to you what, what breaks, what, what makes a, a great InfoSec person is knowing what you don't know and trying to close that gap. Right. And yeah, that advice. had such a profound impact on me to this day. Mm -hmm. And I thank Tyler Robinson for, for breaking that down and, and having that discussion with me. Who's but, uh, uh, Tyler? Tyler is a, a former Guardian who who now works. Uh, he's a co-host um, at Paul Security Weekly now, and ha uh, the host of uh, Tradecraft Weekly over there at Paul Security. So, great guy. Works at so, uh, Trimark right now. So, kind of off topic here, you know, since we're talking about all things security. Did you guys hear about the uh, zip archive or Unix compress CVE that was announced last couple of days ago? They wanted to rename it. It was like CVE 2020 11771, but it was really CVE 2018, but someone forgot to commit the, the fix. And so this unpublished, uh, 
you know, compress command has been bugged for 17 years. And, you know, there's, there's been people taking advantage of this and that they, everyone just kind of overlooked it. You know, I just thought I'd bring that up because it's such a, a small thing that we use, you know, to compress or decompress software that this uh, critical vulnerability, vulnerability has been out there for 17 years. And so they just owned up to it today. So CVE 2018-11771. I actually hadn't heard about this one. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, it's not, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's pretty <laughs> funny. I mean, you know, and someone said, well, how do you, how do you just fix all this stuff? And someone said, well, you just remove all the code. Well, okay. Well, that sort of defeats the purpose. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, you know, let's go goes back to you know everything you know there's always going to be security and issues in something right even something yeah. that's been around as long as that yeah it's been around a while 40 years i think yeah it's, the problem is just finding and disclosing disclosing yeah so we can close those gaps well i also haven't heard about that uh reading about it right now so awesome. you know it might be uh some to kind of look into that everyone overlooks especially on servers. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of servers, uh, any good war stories lately from you guys? Cause you know, I know travel has been a, a issue, uh, due to COVID and everything else, but you know, is it, is it as fun as it used to be? We're used to be able to get out and, you know, do some physical onsite engagements. So do you guys I'll still tell, do that? Uh, uh, we still do, uh, we will do it in, uh, uh, on site once uh, COVID's over. The reason why we yeah. stopped doing that is, is the COVID pandemic. Um, and with that winding down, uh, we, we'll probably get back to it. Uh, but my, my favorite w war story is because of Mouse, uh, the most recent one. Uh, because of Mouse? Because of a mouse. And oh, I'll let mouse. Jared okay. tell it. I'll let Jared tell that story because uh, uh, he tells it way, way better than I do. So we were on kind of a modified red team to some extent. Uh, there was very little people in the know that it was happening. However, we had laptops shipped to us as kind of an insider threat model. Uh, so we had credentials, we had a laptop, we had VPN access. Um, and it cool. was right around the time that the uh, kind of Razor Mouse abuse came out oh, yes. um, to where yes. when you plugged in any well any kind of uh, razor uh, device it would windows uh, update would download the synapsis program and execute it as system and if you um, went to go kind of change the install location you could pop open a uh, explorer window that had admin or system rights and pop a command prompt that way um, so we ended up utilizing that. I went and pre-ordered a mouse, uh, or not pre-ordered, but I ordered a mouse from Best Buy, uh, about an hour before they opened and, and drove my way up there to go, to go pick it up as soon as it opened. Um, came back, popped in the mouse, got s system access. From there, I was able to dump the BitLocker key off of the drive, um, and then boot into safe mode, uh, decrypt the drive with the, the key, and disable any kind of antivirus. So, Jared, uh, had... wait a minute now. Let's back up. You said, <laughs> okay, you just threw a lot at me there. Now, okay. I remember you briefly telling me this in person a couple of weeks ago. You know, I remember hearing about it in the news. And, you know, ironically enough, I had a Razor mouse, uh, but... Windows Update, you know, kept wanting to install the software, which I removed because I didn't want to use it. So long story short, I remember you bringing this up. Let me clarify. Did you just, because you're scaring me here, dude, you just said that you got the BitLocker key? Yeah. So once you have any kind of administrative rights on a system, okay, you can get the BitLocker key easily. Um, even if you're using a TPM for auto decryption and all that stuff, you know, the normal thing that you would want with a Windows system, but you can get that BitLocker key because Windows stores it 
uh, you can just recover it as long as you have, uh, you know, admin privileges to the system. Right. So you just drove down to Best Buy. Let me try this out. Let me check this out to see if it'll work. Just like, hey, sounds like a great idea, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we were we were just starting the engagement. We didn't really try anything else. Uh, we were also already thinking about other methods to try and recover the BitLocker key, uh, like using um, a logic analyzer and different things like that, you know, tearing open the system. But it was all overly complicated uh yeah, and get that, a 30 dollar mouse yeah yeah exactly go get a go get a mouse go get a razor mouse and look at that now i've got system i can do whatever i want with it so, so what did they say when you told them they probably didn't believe you uh what was well, it gets better funny. <laughs> okay well, I'm gonna what's show funny about this is so after we had that level of access booted into safe mode we disabled all uh antivirus uh, and any kind of EDR product, uh, they had, um, I believe it was Carbon Black, and we we disabled that just by renaming uh, the folder, <laughs> and it disabled it. Um, <sighs> booted back up, at that point, we kind of do whatever we wanted to, right? We added our user to the local admins group, we could, uh, we now started molding that system into our own attack machine, and since it was on the VPN, you know, we have an we have their <laughs> laptop they provided as an attack machine connected to their VPN. And sure. what was even more unfortunate is they could do uh, different kinds of checks to validate, you know, their AV is on and working and all that good stuff. And they weren't doing that when you connected to the VPN. So that was big issue number one. But aside from that, once it came to the end of the engagement, we kind of told them how we had gone about doing it they're like you know we disabled uh running that application shortly after identifying the problem and hearing about it on twitter and places like that but it was already days too late and they pushed out the block via the edr that we already disabled so <laughs> right right so and it gets a little worse ahead, because um they didn't have defense in depth. They're relying on that EDR for the logging and alerting and aggregation. Mm -hmm. right. So Jareth and I went completely undetected uh, through the rest of the engagement. They never detected us at all um, from start to finish. Yeah. And it was all because of a mouse. Yeah. Did Hopefully they ended up paying for the mouse. Or do you still have uh, it? No, I still. Oh, it's right it. here. You do. Okay. It's right here. All right. Is it? It's right okay. here. Where it's yeah. plugged in. Yeah. All right. You got to keep that well, uh, copy of that original software too. And there, there. So the the biggest thing there wasn't even just the software. It was that it was being downloaded and ran via Windows installer. Yeah, Windows update. So it yeah. was the trusted installer that was actually running it. Yeah. Um, I know. I have heard some things, and I haven't really looked into it, that there's potentially a lot of other programs that kind of do this similar kind of activity um, that could be abused the same way, and nobody really talks about them. It was a quick uh, couple mentions of it. Uh, I might have a list somewhere. I, I know I saw a list posted to Pastebin at some point, but... Um, yeah, I mean, there's other applications out there that do the similar similar kind of activity where it runs... Windows update uh, via that trusted installer as system, and and you could potentially use that in the same kind of abuse way. So, do you guys ever leverage the GPU, like uh, you know the trusted installer package from NVIDIA or AMD? I have not, no. But that would be a good idea. I, I believe it specifically asks for administrative rights to install that kind of stuff. Oh, no. So because it it's doesn't. signed, no, it does not. Hmm. Yeah, but you would need physical access to, you know, insert that video card. That would be the only issue. Yes, yes. Yeah. And and the only reason why this mouse worked uh, it was because uh, we had physical yeah. access to those laptops yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, but still, you know, the the TPM leveraging or any BIOS type of thing you know same thing applies if they're going to give you physical access why not take it you know right 
that we have a rule. If we could touch it, we could own it. Yeah. It reminds me of the bank story that someone told me about that. And I don't know if you guys want to talk about the bank story or not, Jareth, but you know, you're obviously welcome to, since we're on the topic of stories and stuff and you know, which one I'm referring to where they were taking Are pictures you... of your vehicle when you were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely had quite a few on-site kind of social engineering engagements. The one that you're referring to, I'm assuming is where uh, we had the police out looking for my vehicle. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes yeah. if I remember correctly, it was um I'll call I'll I'll call him out by name. Colin. Uh yeah. He yeah. uh <laughs> yeah. he he went into uh one of these uh clients that we had, a bank, and uh was acting, I believe is like printer repair, uh trying to get access to some kind of sensitive area. And uh, when the person he was interacting with walked away to go uh, check in with some people, see if he was supposed to be there, that kind of thing, he just kind of wandered off into private areas, uh, started digging around under people's desks and things like that. Uh, the person had caught him. He's like, oh, okay, no, I'll just, I'll come back later and, and walked out the door, we jumped in the vehicle, left. Uh, we got on site to actually do the rest of the engagement and they had... Uh, mock wanted posters all over the place uh with with colin's pictures uh <laughs> right, right. and uh said the police were actually right. out looking looking for our vehicle they had pulled camera footage from a building across the street or something to try and pull the license plate so uh we could have gotten pulled over uh i think it was a a four hour drive or something after that point so yeah. for about Four hours after that, the cops were looking for our vehicle. Somehow didn't catch us. So. Right. Yeah, that's a little bit I of have, a risk there that you guys take. Right. One of my favorite yeah. stories to tell about that risk and having cops involved um, is uh, how bad this one engagement went from the beginning to the end. Uh, so I was doing an on-site social engineering engagement as well. Um, and my partner was inside trying to plug in a Dropbox and I'm in another part of the building also trying to plug in a Dropbox and I look up at my car and I look over and I see a truck slowly rolling downhill, picking up speed. I remember this. You called me. <laughs> I remember yes. you calling me on the phone and it was late. Dude. And the, the car. Be... Yeah. The car smashed into yes. our rental car yes totaled yeah. our rental car because it was like a down a really steep hill so it just you know here comes like this giant f-350 the person didn't put it in park and it just started rolling down the hill picking up speed smashed right into yeah. uh, my rental car totaling it it's like something I from the movie with... sneakers you know <laughs> right so I come out of the of the building. I, I have the Dropbox in, throw it in. The security guard comes out of the building, figured out what happened. My partner comes out. I wave him off. The cops come. We do the whole thing. And then we, we go uh, take it back. And I call my boss. And I'm like, what do I do? He's just like, how far away is the rental car place? And I'm like, yo, I, it's like an hour and a half away. And I called him. And they, they were going to bring out another car the next day when boss is like, get back to work. Right. And right. so my partner right. and I had to go back into the building with right. the total car with right. the security guard there. And, um, you know, we had to shake it all off and we had to park around and do some stuff. We ended up stealing, um, all their wire, the paper wire transfers. They used to print all that stuff off. We ended up walking out of the buildings with that stuff. Um, I ended up uh, walking up to the CEO saying I'm the intern uh, and I, we're going to do a new laptop swap for you. And he gave me his laptop and the CFO held the door open for me. We ended up walking away with a bunch of stuff. Um, but uh, when we did the walkthrough, the security guard like was like, I knew something was wrong about you guys. Like this is something <laughs> felt wrong. I should have right, been like, right. you know, keeping my eyes on. But the engagement went so sideways. Um, 
because I had to go through all the insurance stuff with the police and security guard and pulling the cameras footage out and all this stuff. And then I went back in and, and continued the, the work sure. afterwards. I didn't know what to do. Like, yeah. am I supposed to stop working? Like, yeah. Uh, so, so where's that going in today's world? I mean, is that needed? Is that changing? Is that the same? COVID kind of changed a lot of things. So where do you, where do you guys see, you know, three, five years from now with physical engagements? I think it's going to be different. Yeah. Right. A lot of places, a lot of companies don't, uh, are closing down offices, right. Even historic buildings. Um, my father's company that he works for, um, has a landmark building in a city. Uh, the building is known for them and they ended up just selling it cause they don't need it all the remote. Like they just moved everything remote. Right. Um, so a lot of other stuff too, um, you know, the, some companies are working remote, some companies aren't, I just think it's going to be as important, uh, just different, meaning we're going to target different buildings, um, more, more along the lines of, I say maybe data centers or dedicated data centers, not shared dates, data centers, it buildings. Right. Um, and yeah, I think so it's going to be more along the lines of like access control, a lot of access control and bypass uh, stuff is where I see it. Big so way. that physical presence is gone. That equipment's no longer in that building. So it's somewhere on someone's cloud somewhere. Uh, is it easier or harder? Your job. He's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it that's kind of a hard is, one yes. to i mean it it can be right i mean at that point for us when it comes to any kind of on-site or or physical engagement thing things of that nature you know we spend a lot of time traveling we spend a lot of energy kind of doing that that stuff right i mean i when i started counting out the the amount of hours it took me to travel to and from a client i think i was traveling for probably 10 to 15 hours per engagement um and now with you know a lot of that kind of physical being removed from it people getting rid of offices things like that that now 15 hours gets put back into uh reading and uh observing recon you know different kinds of things that um i mean we would probably do on a physical but now we're doing virtually we're able to identify more things things kind of exist forever on the internet right, right. so it just kind of depends on the situation so you um, guys have more research time for your engagement prep time i uh different no? different kind of different? prep time i mean i i can say that there's a lot of organizations that even though they went remote they probably weren't ready to go remote and so it ends up putting a giant hole Mm -hmm. right uh, on you know into their organization out on the internet as opposed to you know having some kind of hole physically right and usually that hole digitally is a lot bigger or a lot worse than that that physical hole i would say right but physicals will never go away because there's physics the stuff's got to run on hardware somewhere right yeah it does and yep. so you know, uh, just because it's cloudless and serverless to you doesn't mean there isn't a server somewhere running that application, right? So that's where a security control has got to be. Um, you know, the colos, uh, the colocations, uh, the data centers, all that stuff. Um, very important to to test and ensure their security. So if I was a brand new student and uh, tomorrow is my very first day in IT security classes. And I'm not sure, you know, if really, if I want to invest my time, effort and energy and give up, you know, my family time and all that stuff to do what you guys do. What would you tell me? Don't do it, Jay. Don't do it. Or would you tell me this is what you need to do? It depends, right? Yeah. Does that person have a passion for it? Because if, if you don't have... If you're not, you don't have a passion for it, uh, it's not going to be fun, right? Uh, the burnout is real. 
burnout is very real and it usually comes when people uh don't have a passion for it or have lost their passion and then they ended up just burning out and you know that's never a good thing for the individual it's never a good thing for the, for the organizations right but more importantly for the individual um yeah we so were talking it, yeah before the podcast and you were saying having a hobby is important you know i yeah. i know you guys have families and uh your everyone's family looks different and so how do you find all the time to you know do what you got to do to take care of you and do what you do to keep your job for me personally and i know rob's got you know bigger family than i do but uh i mean i still try to keep that family time as much as possible right uh I just recently had a niece, and so I've been trying to spend a lot of time there with my brother, uh, his fiance, and my niece. And um, I mean, it maybe isn't as much as I would like, but uh, you know, you still got to work, right? Regardless of any kind of industry that you're in. So that that time period that you would be normally at a job, you know, nine to five or whatever, um, you're going to be spending that learning. Uh, doing what you would do anyway in our case working with clients or you know what have you i mean the the biggest thing is to find the balance but also be very invested and interested in your field if you want to be in security you want to keep up to date you want to be reading you want to do that kind of stuff um but you also don't like rob said get burnt out on it right you need to find that balance of your family, your personal time, your hobby, but also your passion uh, and and work, right? And, and for me, my hobbies involve my kids for the most part, right? So I try to uh, spend my hobby time with my kids. Um, I try to go out of my way to, to have dedicated date nights with my significant other. Right. So me and my wife have dedicated date nights. We go out, we spend time. Uh, my cell phone gets shut off. Right. And it's just me, just her. Um, when I'm with my kids, it's just my kids. We're playing games, uh, we're playing music, uh, whatever. Right. Um, the most important time is, is to just, you know, when you're doing it, you, you, you know, if it's by yourself, like for me, every night, uh, I read. Right. And I said X amount of chapters are, are the book, right? I read. Um, that's my time, right? And it could be something as simple as reading a technical book or reading my guilty pleasures, um, right? Or whatever I'm reading at that moment. Um, and, but in between time, you know, spend time with my kids, spend time with my family, practice my my hobbies and incorporate my family into my hobbies so that it's, it's a dual, I know it sounds bad, but you know, I'm getting both spending time with my family, but we're doing it in such a way that we both enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Um, for me, that's how I, how I do it. For those of you who don't know, I got five kids, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, it could be as, you know, simple as sitting down, watching a couple of episodes of, of anime, or you know with with some of my kids or uh watching the sounders game or you know uh paint with my kids or uh work through music theory and and you know i got a percussion two percussionists i got a reed player uh a horn player and i'm a guitarist and you know uh some other budding guitarists so you know just sitting down there playing music reading music very important right yeah um, the other yeah. thing i will say is uh is take your time off right very important um recharge your batteries it's important i can agree uh, with that for sure that. yeah i just uh just had some time off last week and it i mean you think week away from work isn't really that long realistically but it does help so much to get away and just kind of not think about it unplug for a bit um some of the things that i try to do uh to not kind of hit that burnout point is a lot of times for me i will 
kind of during the, the work day, if it comes to reading, uh, either before or after work, I'll usually try to orient that somehow, uh, you know, browsing the web, Twitter, different things like that, kind of reading uh, anything that's security related is generally how I'll, I'll treat those kind of reading research times. But uh, after a certain point at night, I'll, I'll kind of shut off, get away from technology. Uh, on the weekends, I'll usually get away from the computer. Uh, the amount of time that I touch a computer on the weekend is almost none. Um, I sometimes hard. try to get out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll still have my phone, right? You know, I still got that kind of technology, but it's a different, a different approach rather than sitting in front of a monitor, right? For me, at my desk, I've got three 27-inch monitors. You're literally surrounded by, by technology. So I try to step away from that. Um, as much as I can and try to um, spend kind of the time, like I said, away from that kind of nine to five. I'll try to orient it as much as possible away from uh, kind of being involved with technology, which kind of sucks too, because I also have a huge hobby of playing games, but it, it's definitely treated differently mentally uh, than worrying about work or security or, or learning, right? But the, the key thing is to tell that person is find whatever you're passionate about, right? Even if it's not information security, if you ain't passionate about it, then it's going to be a harder uphill battle for you. Yeah. Um, if you're passionate about something, that's going to make it so much easier. Kind of just happens naturally to some extent. The, the worst part about it when you are passionate is worrying about that burnout because sometimes you do focus on it too much that's why it's important to get away try and disconnect use that you know time off when you can things like that so do you guys ever uh, refresh yourselves on the basics of, of software stuff topics oh yeah yeah oh yeah it, it, you know um it, it's just important especially with like windows updates and new new systems but just go back in because um, one of the things I always talk about is sharpening your sword, right? Our knowledge is, is a sword and you got to sharpen and steel, sharpen steel. So if you're not out there sharpening your sword, uh, going over to basics, going over, you know, advanced forms, uh, you're just going to lose it, right? So you got to sharpen your sword and the, and the very basic, uh, the very basic stone is, hey, you know, do I got this stuff right down? And it, it it's funny because... Um, it's very apparent when you forget the basics, like when I'm working with Jareth, that you'll be like, you're trying too hard, right? You know, you know, keep it simple here. You know, you forgot said, you forgot awk, you forgot this one delimiter flag. I know you know it. You've, you've seen it. I've seen you do it before, right? And then that's my cue to be like, yep, got to go back right. and sharpen my sword, right? Um, right. You know, may not be apparent to you, but it will be apparent to people around you and surrounding yourself with good people um, and, and good coworkers that, you know, that goes back to the ego, right? When they yeah. say, hey, man, you know, I've seen you do this before. What's going on? That's, you know, you got to take your, your ego and be like, yep, got to go back, sharpen that because everything's evolving, everything's moving, and you can't remember every detail ever. Um, and so it's important to go back over and render the basics over again, when you see it slipping or other people point it out or, you know, it happens to me all the time. Yeah. I and think it's good advice. Jared. Yeah. To all of us actually. Yep. It's perishable skills that we're dealing with. 100%. Yeah. So I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to, you know, to from your families, from your hobbies, all that stuff to do a uh, Clover Parks podcast, you know, for the network operations system security uh, team that you guys were once part of. And uh, I'd love to have you back. So you guys willing to come back? I'd love maybe to. Absolutely. Another, another topic, of course, maybe we could just make it one topic, you know, instead of, oh man, Jay just wants to talk about me. It's kind of, kind of weird, but uh, yeah. So I'm thinking like, uh, you know, like a really, cool topic of maybe like the like a latest threat and uh what you guys have done or what you plan on doing 
Uh, we don't want to give anything away, you know, to your potential future clients, but maybe some things that have happened in the past that, you know, we can just kind of talk about that's uh, IT security related, like how to break into a Palo Alto firewall. You can't. <laughs> Oh, you can bypass Palo Alto right, firewalls right. by <laughs> by yeah. nope, nope sledding, yeah. not sledding, right? right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, just break into the firewall. No, it's not going to happen. Doesn't work that way. No, so. it's not the movie. I mean, it also depends on if you're you're upgrading. I mean, I th I think there's some old RCEs for Palo Alto, so if you're not installing the latest firmware, right? Anything with Pan, you know that there's a problem, especially when they drop pan nine and 10 within about a couple of months after one another. So I, I will say this is not like the movies, right? You know, I got to bring the firewall down and five minutes later, firewall goes out. No, uh, it ain't like that. Right. So have you guys seen the movie sneakers? Only the best hacker movie ever made. It is. It is awesome. I think everybody should watch that movie. That's going into it. That really sums it up you know, from a 360 point of view. So anyway, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you. 